Thanks for coming. It seems that there must have been another event because normally I speak to a full audience. So, Anyway, it's a great pleasure for me to be back here. I've been coming to Guatemala and, and this fine university since 1997, before some of you were born, perhaps. Uh, so it's, it's always a pleasure for me to come back. I have a slight confession to make. Although I'm going to give you a rather pessimistic view of China's future, I have to confess that I've had a love affair with China, uh, at least for most of my present lifetime. It, it comes from artifacts that my grandfather brought back from when he was in the Navy back at the turn of the uh, 20th century, beginning of the, at the end of the 19th century. And so I, these sort of artifacts gave me a curiosity about the, the other parts of the world, especially China. And I was lucky enough to be invited by the Chinese government in 1987 to teach functionaries from the finance ministry about free markets. So I've had a, a long connection with China. And uh, I'd like to see China prosper uh, and do better in the future, but I think there are some good reasons to believe that the um, uh, more recent positive uh, changes in China may not continue. So uh, what we're going to do is the title, The Mother of All Bubbles. In other words, there's never been a bigger bubble. Well, you've got to understand what bubbles are to understand what the, the title means. So we'll discuss that briefly. And then I'll look at the rise and decline of China's economic performance. Now, I was famous for maybe two and a half minutes because I wrote a book called The Rise and Decline of the Asian Century. This came out in uh, 1997, just before the East and Southeast Asian economies collapsed. They were on a growth trajectory that was never going to end. I suggested that it probably would end in, in unhappiness. It did. It made me famous for you know, a few moments. Uh, so I've been quite interested in, in been publishing quite a bit about Asia since the, uh, certainly since the late 1980s. So what we're going to do, the, the moral of this tale that I'm going to tell you today, the story that I'll tell you is that government interventions, whether or not they're well-intended or based upon evil or ideology, lead to distortions and imbalances in the economy that will lead to these Artificial moments, a boom, we sometimes call it, that is a high uh, rate of growth, that ends in misery, that is a bust. So the, these bubbles always burst, and the bubbles are always created by government action, primarily central bank policy. So what are economic bubbles? Well, bubbles occur... This is a description of, of events where we have exaggerated and unsustainable prices of either resources or assets. So the asset could be real estate or stocks or bonds. The resource could be oil or gold or whatever. So what we have seen throughout history, there's a lot of these bubbles that have occurred. And each and every one of them, it, it's a, a longer story that I won't tell in this particular uh, lecture, but all bubbles have always been caused by central bank policies. Um, in other words, what we find is that central banks make excess liquidity available. That availability of credit leads to uh, people finding more and more resources to spend. This drives up prices. And once central banks, as we are seeing at the present time, begin to observe high rates of price inflation, they begin to put on the brakes, and this is the uh, beginning of the end of these bubbles. Now, so what we see then is that when we have a bubble, trades occur in commodities or assets at uh, high prices that have nothing to do with economic fundamentals or intrinsic values. So they're all based upon air, in a sense, and that air is that excess liquidity primarily created by central banks. So generally what we see, if, if you're, you're old enough to have heard about the housing bubble in the United States, 
there was a great deal of optimism in the, the mid-2000s, 2005 and 6 and 7, where people believed that housing prices would only go up. They would continue to rise. You could buy at very high prices today, and tomorrow someone will pay you an even higher price. So what this means is that people overextend themselves with respect to debt because they believe that they'll be able to escape from that debt by selling off those assets to some sucker, some, somebody that uh, is uh, willing to take on those higher prices. Now, bubbles can form in any asset or any uh, resource. So, for example, we've had uh, commodity bubbles, we've had uh, asset bubbles, we've had real estate bubbles. We've, now we have a global bond bubble. The bond market in the, the global bond market is an order of magnitude larger than the stock market. So many of you know something about stocks or equities. You may have owned them or know people that own them through um, uh, investments. But the bond market is much, much larger. Uh, and what we will see is that this inflated bond market, bond prices are at historic highs because interest rates are at historic lows. And bond prices and bond uh, and, and interest rates paid for on bonds move in opposite directions. So if interest rates rise, bond prices fall. And this puts us in a very dangerous situation because as interest rates are rising around the world, we're beginning to see people trying to avoid capital losses on their bonds by selling them off. And that whenever, if you've taken economics, you know that if people are trying to sell something, if they need to sell it, they'll sell it at a lower price. So they bid prices down to get rid of it. And when bond prices go down, interest rates go up further, inducing people to sell bonds in panic mode, driving down the prices, driving interest rates up. And this can cause economic chaos and financial collapse. So now the end occurs to any bubble when, it, when the central banks begin to observe that price inflation is unacceptably high. The Throughout the world, for, the, for much of the two th early 2000s or mid-2000s, central banks had observed very low price inflation. They had a target rate, most of them, of 2% price inflation. And very few economies experienced price inflation in excess of that, with the exception of outliers like Argentina or Venezuela, countries where there was grotesque irresponsibility by both the fiscal and monetary authorities. Now, what's happened over time is that there was so much liquidity pumped into the uh, global markets. Part of it was based upon fiscal policy uh, in pursuit of COVID pandemic policies where they shut down the economies, people were out of work, so governments began handing out money to people who were unemployed, uh, this uh, put pressure on um, the uh, governments to raise money through borrowing. They were able to borrow because interest rates were very low. And this seemed to be working out fine until interest rates began, uh, sorry, inflation rates began to creep up. So we began to see in many countries a situation that had not been seen since in the developed economies, Western Europe, uh, North America, uh, Japan, and so on, they hadn't experienced price inflation at, 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 to the degree that they have recently. Uh, now, as the central banks respond to price inflation, they pull back on the availability of credit, which makes uh, interest rates rise. Uh, they they uh, try to push up interest rates. And there's what we would call a credit crunch. That is, people find it uh, very difficult to, to find money. Or if they do, they have to pay a very high interest rate to get it. So interest rates begin to return to a sort of long-term, normal uh, range, what we would call the natural rate. And business models that were able to borrow at very low interest rates, only because the interest rates were very low, 
all of a sudden find themselves in an unenviable situation where having to pay higher interest rates, they're unable to carry that and sustain their operations. So weak business models begin to uh, collapse, and this is this end of this boom. So central banks, by cutting interest rates, by allowing uh, excess credit creation, created these bubble conditions, this boom, or this illusion of economic growth that begins to disappear as central banks reverse their policies, drive up interest rates, uh, try to, to uh, reduce the credit and end the boom. Now, so the reality is if we look at markets, markets tend to have small variations. That is, there can be uh, situations where markets will overshoot, but there are built-in conditions in the market in terms of profits and losses, for example, the impact of prices, supply and demand, technology, and so on. So what we see is very limited swings based upon market conditions. Whenever we see wide swings in economic activity, we know that that must be some external factors. And those primary external factors are fiscal policy and monetary policy. So what we find is that although markets are often blamed for recessions, most recessions can be traced back to some combination of fiscal and monetary policy that created, uh, in many instances, an artificial boom, a bubble, and leading eventually to a, an unhappy end. So let's look at China. Now, of course, if you, any of you have been paying attention, uh, we know that bef uh, China's had impressive growth. I first went to China in 1987. China in 1987 was still a command economy. Uh, people lived in the, uh, what they called a work unit. They worked in the work unit. They died in the work unit. They studied in the work unit. They went to the hospital in the work unit. There was no choice of, a very limited choice of uh, profession or career or of deciding where you wanted to live. You were born into a work unit, and you probably would work there as your parents did. So, but over time, we saw China began to open up to markets. The Chinese Communist Party, above all things, loves power. It doesn't love the Chinese people. It loves power. And they saw that if they did not begin to deliver economic some aspect of economic gains to the general population, they would lose the political support of the people. Because what was happening around the world as the Soviet Union was in either retreat and then collapse, we began seeing countries around the world beginning to prosper, to, to escape the cycles of poverty where they seemed to have been stuck in previous years. And Chinese people would, would be aware of that and would begin to say, well, why not us? And so the Chinese Communist Party decided that, well, let's get in on this game. Let's uh, join this globalization process. And they were very successful in doing that. So what we saw before 2007 and 2008, China had 6% of global GDP, and now it's around 16%. 200 years ago, China had half of the world's GDP. And, in, well, but between China and India, there was roughly a half, I guess. That would be a better. Uh, so what we saw several centuries before, population was the primary basis for a large economy. But what we discovered in the Industrial Revolution, productivity, technology, those became the important drivers of economic growth and prosperity. And so China was lagging behind because China had very low productivity. It was a communist, centrally planned economy. Even though it had a large population, its presence in the global economy shrank. And then after 19, uh, 
I guess, 1980s, in the mid-1980s, China began to experience economic growth. Now, more recently, what we began to see is that much of this growth was based upon a massive increase in debt. In other words, they owe money to get this economic growth. Now, of course, this is what, even under normal capitalist economies, but under capitalist economies, when you borrow and lend, it's based upon economic logic. So borrowing and lending is based upon my ability to repay my debts to you and your expectation of me to do so. Whereas in China, the decisions about borrowing and lending were based upon politics, ideology. The Communist Party decided where the money would go. And primarily, the, the investments, not prim mostly went into state-owned enterprises. Now, so what we find is that several sort of uh, estimates here, the Institute for International Finance, which is part of the IMF, puts the debt-to-GDP ratio that rose from 150% of GDP in 2008 to 303%. Now, that's a big increase. Now, it turns out that before 2007, 2008, uh, it took roughly $1 of capital spending and you would get more than one dollar of output. Fast forward to today, they need four dollars of investment to get roughly one dollar of output. Doesn't sound like such a good deal, does it? It takes four dollars to create one dollar. Nah. So this is a this is this will become a problem for China. Now, there was what we call shadow bank lending. The local governments were not allowed to borrow. So what they did, the local government set up these uh, vehicles, these uh, financial vehicles, and they borrowed and lent through that. Now, what happens is that uh, China's total debt is actually much larger when we look at, and it's much more precarious, because most of the local government debt was used for infrastructure projects, and much of the revenues from that came from property developments. Now, as we're going to see in a moment, China has an overbuilt property market with wildly bubbled prices. That is, the prices for Chinese housing is, is higher than it is in the U.S. per square meter. Now, the IMF puts China's central government debt-to-GDP ratio at roughly 73%, which isn't, I mean, the United States is roughly 100% now. Uh, the problem with a command economy, and in many ways China is still a command economy, China is not a capitalist economy. China's economy, a capitalist economy suggests that capital can be transferred, the ownership of capital can be transferred through some market process, buying and selling. Most of the listed companies on the Chinese stock markets are state-owned enterprises. So they're not going to be sold. They will remain on the books of the central government. And many of the other companies are owned by local governments. So a capitalist economy would be one where the ownership of companies or shares could be transferred through purchases, and you could control a company. This doesn't happen. It can't happen in China. There still is extensive control by the central government. Now, so there's a lot of hidden debt, local uh, government, another $7 trillion. Uh, it's up four times. It's now 52% of GDP. So China is in a... A, a, a very bad situation because there is so much outstanding debt that they have to have very high economic growth rates to generate enough revenues, either tax revenues or revenues by the companies to repay their debts, tax revenues for the government to repay its debts, or they go into default. Now, 
This isn't happening to China. What we're beginning to see, China had, a, okay, first of all, China's economy began from a very low base, right? A very small economy. They weren't exporting anything to speak of until the mid-1980s. So it was relatively easy for the, when you start from a low base, it's easy to have high growth rates. And you can have those for, for quite a while. It's just a matter of numbers, right? Mathematics. So now China's reached the point where its economy is so large, it becomes much more difficult to have high enough growth rates in order to generate enough revenues, either tax revenues for the government to repay its debts or income for companies to repay their debt or to purchase uh, resources to pay workers. So this becomes quite a precarious situation. Now, China's facing two problems there. First of all, the growth rate has declined post-COVID. Well, COVID kicked everybody's economy in the backside, China's in particular. The supply chains have, been, have, have not fully recovered. So China's ability to export has been dampened. The, at, the, at the same time, interest rates are going up in other parts of the world, especially in the United States, but partly true in, in uh, the European Union economies. And so that means that the debt burden will rise over time. So China's facing several sources of problems in that regard. So we're seeing a reversal of fortunes. There's a vicious cycle. They begin to see slowing growth. And one of the things that you, you should know about China, from, and this is purely anecdotal from from my part. When I first went to China, there was misery everywhere, of course, except among government officials. They didn't suffer much. Government officials do well everywhere. But the misery, the, the day-to-day misery in China was, was so evident. Now, as I continued going to China over the years, every year I went back, I became enthusiastic. I saw people being able to choose their careers, choose where to live, choose who to be. And the leadership from Deng Xiaoping on until the current leader were very pragmatic. That is, they wanted to implement policies that ensured continued economic growth. And that was now, they did that because they wanted to stay in power. They did that. They did do it because they loved the Chinese people like I do. They did it because they wanted to keep in power. Now, the current president, Xi Jinping, is a uh, cult figure like Mao, in a way. He has amassed political power in his, in his own hands and increased the centralization of political power in his hands. So what happens now is that we had a dictatorship of the proletariat in the hands of the Communist Party, and now we have an autocracy in the hands of Xi Jinping. And the Chinese Communist Party are playing, you know, they're, they're, they're his support team. Whereas in the past, the Chinese Communist Party was the source of power, and whoever ran it was sort of in the background. It's kind of, it's been flipped now. So now what we see is more and more political control. You've got, when you're an autocrat, you're terrified of those who would replace you. So you have to eliminate them either through using corruption as an accusation or some other violation of uh, patriotism, nationalism, whatever. So what we see is that more political control has been imposed, which creates slower economic growth, which makes it necessary, if you want to stay in power, to have more political control, which slows economic growth, which inspires more political control, and so on. So we're seeing this cycle in China beginning to happen. Now, pandemic policies, which were, by the way, you should all realize that liberal democracies 
imitated a dictatorship in China in pursuing their policy choices against the pandemic, which is bizarre beyond belief. All these pandemic policies that were adopted, whether in Guatemala and North America, wherever, Europe, were imitating the bloody Chinese, a dictatorship. Why would people who believe in economic, political freedom believe that the answers to any question, whether it's public health or economics, would be solved by a dictatorship? But anyway, that's how we got to where we were. The pandemic policy... The pandemic policies killed more people than COVID did. Uh, that's another lecture I would have to give. But the pandemic policies were an economic, social, cultural disaster. And it's changed everything. Your lives will never be the same. Uh, some of you may or may not have been in high school over the last beginning of all of this. So you stayed at home or, or even here you were on Zoom during that time. But pandemic policies have changed everything. So there's no new global realities. The fear and loathing of climate change is affecting the way people live and consume, which I think is going to be the next big economic, social, and cultural disaster if governments are able to enforce all these green technology requirements on us. So China is in a relatively bad situation, much of which was caused by its own choices, and they were worsened by the new leadership in the hands of Xi Jinping. So what about China's miracle economy? Well, so there's a couple of questions that, that one should ask when you think about this. Now, are China's economic laws and political logic unique. In other words, is China living in a different economic reality? Uh, and is the sort of political response and the public policy choices that they make based upon different or new economic laws or new economic realities? China depended heavily at the beginning of its growth phase on export-led development. Uh, is this a model for economic growth? And what is the impact of demography on China? Because China is an aging society. They have passed, uh, they, they've fallen below the replacement uh, fertility rates. So China's uh, population will begin to shrink because uh, they're, they're, the uh, average age is rising and many fewer workers are coming into the workforce relative to the pensioners. There's a lot of problems there. Now, are we living in Asian century or the Chinese century? Well, I told you I wrote a book called The Rise and Decline of the Asian Century. In that, there was a chapter on China and I suggested... Uh, now, one of the things that drives my understanding of China was my earlier understanding of what was happening in Japan, another economic powerhouse in the 60s, 70s, 80s, until it wasn't. So Japan had the first bubble economy of the modern era. Japan's economy was going to overtake the United States economy by the 1990s. Just like China's economy is going to overtake and become the dominant economy. Well, for the same reasons that Japan failed to become the world's largest economy, I, I'm afraid the same argument applies to China. So we have to know a little bit about what was going on in Japan to see what might happen in China. Now, so when we look at China's economic growth, is it a miracle or is it a bubble? Well, this was where I started back in the early 90s. There was a lot of talk about the miracle economies of East Asia. I, I'm not religious, but I know that, you know, even in religion, 
Miracles, you know, are, are subjected to all kinds of inquiries before they are substantiated by the Vatican, for example. So they're extremely rare. And they actually go against human logic. I mean, I mean, you say, wow, it's a miracle because it's not the way we normally think about things. It goes against that. So what happened, I believe, is that China was able in large part to have this economic growth, not because there was any kind of miraculous discovery of economic laws that nobody else had ever observed. It's that China in many ways was imitating Japan. Now in Japan was able to grow very rapidly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s because its economy had been destroyed by World War II. So it was starting at a very low base. So high growth rates, well, why not? Just a matter of mathematics. And nobody was competing with Japan. In the 60s, nobody was competing with Japan. China was blocked out. The Soviet Union economies were blocked out. Africa, forget. Latin America, siesta. Nobody was competing with Japan. They had the export markets pretty much themselves. So they found their way. They started off like China did later. Ceramics, machine tools, toys, simple things. Because they were rebuilding, in the case of Japan, a rebuilding an industrial economy. China was trying to discover an industrial economy. And they followed pretty much the same pattern. Now, China being so massively large was able to expand production very rapidly and provide very low cost, very low quality products for the world. But at the same time, what we saw is that we began to see the availability of liquidity because outsiders wanted to invest in China, and we began to see uh, an unsustainable rise in production that redistributed and destroyed wealth. This is what happens when we have bubbles. Bubbles redistribute wealth. It allows people with bad business models to borrow at very low interest rates that they are unable to sustain when interest rates go back up. So if you're unable to borrow at high interest rates and you borrow at low interest rates, you're unable to pay them back when you have to roll over your debt sometime in the future. So uh, China has an overbuilt and overvalued property market that's beginning to deflate. Several of the largest property developers in China are in terrible shape because they are unable to repay their debts. Now, how did China get it? Why was I wrong in my book? Because I predicted that China would follow Japan, and that book was finished in 1994-5, and here we are in 2000. Uh, 23. So China was able to continue growing much longer than I imagined. And the reason was, I believe, is that central banks around the world kept boosting liquidity, making it available to their population, people finding quetzales in their pockets. They went to spend them at Price Mart. Price Mart went to China and bought Chinese products. And China bought American treasury bonds. And this just kept a, a, what we call a pyramid scheme, a Ponzi scheme going. So central banks created liquidity and it found its way to China. And it came back. China barred, or sorry, uh, bought bonds in the U.S. treasury market. And this just kept going around and around. This was all very happy as long as it kept going. But like every Ponzi scheme, it comes to an end. These Ponzi schemes are these pyramid schemes where you have to have more buyers in order for this, this scheme to be able to pay off the uh, debt requirements. And once the buyers begin to disappear the Ponzi scheme collapses, or in other words, the bubble deflates. So China really, China being able to continue growing until recently really had to do with the support of central banks. 
outside of China primarily that were following their, their own policies of having artificially low interest rates. Interest rates went to zero and even became negative in many cases. There were billions of dollars of uh, debt issued in Europe, for example, at negative nominal interest rates. In other words, you would get back less money than you gave them when you bought their debt which goes against human nature, unless it's family, of course. I mean, you expect that with family, uh, if you get any of it back, but uh, maybe friends. But in economic reality, when you loan money, you expect to get not only what you lent, but a little bit more. We call that time preference. You want to be compensated for that foregoing of current consumption. So China would really depend upon central banks continuing to have promiscuously low interest rates and promiscuously excessive uh, credit availability. Now, once this dried up, because in Europe and North America, we begin to see price inflation that alarmed the central banks into putting the brakes on credit expansion, allowing interest rates to rise again. This puts China under pressure. So, now, so let me give you the background again. I've I've given you some of this. Japan had very high economic growth in the 50s to 1980s. Now, what they, I mean, people actually believe, I mean, this is the reason I got interested. They said, wow, the Japanese have discovered new economic laws. I'm like, oh my God, I have a PhD in economics, and that means that, and I don't know about these economic laws. I mean, what is that? That makes my degree not, you know, devalues my degree. So I wanted to know about these new economic, well, that's nothing new about it. The Japanese imitated mercantilism, which some of you may have studied. Mercantilism was an, an economic doctrine that was pursued by the Uh, emperors and kings of Europe, where they believed that uh, exports were good, imports were bad, because they uh, understood wealth to be the stock of gold or some sort of precious commodity that was used for international exchanges. So if we, if I, the king of England, was, uh, if my country was importing from France, I was losing gold, so I was poorer. So this idea uh, was actually the basis for imperialism and colonialism. Uh, that uh, uh, and what we see is that Adam Smith came along, and in 1776 he said, "That's completely wrong. That's nuts. That's crazy. The wealth of a nation is based upon the productive capacity of its people." and its willingness to trade. In fact, if you really want to grow, you should import. Because imports will mean that your citizens have access to many more cheaper products, which means they have money left over to buy domestic products. So importing is the way to grow. Well, Japan, I guess, I mean, they... um, Somebody may have studied Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, but they were able to get away with this export-led development uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, well, and this, this was, and, and they, they felt like this high growth rate validated the idea that exports were good and that you should limit imports. Uh, people believed this was going to go on forever. Uh, There was a book called Japan is Number One. Now, what happened was it all blew up in their face in 1989. It was based upon monetary policy that was excessively loose. It was based upon fiscal policies that were aiming at promoting exports. But again, how did they get away with it? Well, they got away with it, as I mentioned a moment ago, because they weren't being... They didn't have many competitors in the rest of the global economy. So what we saw is that in 1989, this was the beginning of the end. 
Surplus capacity destroyed profits. The stock market and the urban property lost two-thirds of its value. Two-thirds of its value. Now, the Nikkei index, which is the index for the stocks traded in Japan, it is today lower than it was in 1989. It hasn't recovered since then. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. This is how much wealth was destroyed. Now, the good news was Japan was already rich when it happened. And as an aside, the bad news is what China is looking at in terms of following Japan down the same path, China is not a rich country yet. China is a, has a rich government, but has poor people. Now, so what we see, Japan's economy is today below the long-term growth rate that it had previously. It's roughly 2 or 3%. And then that's after or before or during uh, slowdowns and retreats in GDP growth. Japan's economy, uh, if Japan had not been a rich country, it would be in terrible shape. Uh, of course, the good thing is in Japan is that they have... Uh, Sony, they have Honda, and so on. So they, they do have some very uh, strong, uh, strong. Now, other countries that imitate Japan are going to suffer the same fate because export-led growth is not a model that's sustainable. Now, what happened in Japan is as the costs in Japan were rising, a lot of the production went offshore into Southeast Asia. For example, a lot of automobile production in Thailand. And we begin to see the, the Korean economy growing very rapidly, eating into Japan's export markets. Uh, Taiwan was doing that. Hong Kong was doing that. So we begin to see uh, growth in all of these other Asian economies that were eating away at Japan's dominance of the export market. Japan's economy collapsed, and then, you know, the East Asian economy said, hey, wow, look what happened to us. We're still doing great. Whoops. 1997, their economies collapsed. Why? Because China. China ate their export markets, took them away. So that's the story about Japan. So the, the, the idea of export-led growth, Japan was... Success, successful, I should have put that in scare quotes, their success was based upon happenstance, communism, centrally planned economies. Nobody was competing with them. Um, and they were just kind of lucky. You know, the, the, the other thing is the Western governments wanted Japan to be strong and to recover rapidly to be a counterbalance geopolitically against China. Because China was a communist power that was developing in Asia. So they wanted Japan, an historic enemy or competitor, or rival, whatever. They wanted Japan. So they, they said, well, let's import from Japan. Let's, let's, you know, let's be nice. Let's play nice with Japan. So there's very little resistance to Japanese imports. So uh, 50s to 70s, few competitors. Uh, as I mentioned, Southeast and East Asia ate into Japan's dominance. And uh, China and the end of the Soviet Union led to the end of the Southeast Asian economy. Now, the Southeast Asian economies and the Asian economies have recovered better than Japan has. Um, now, how did export-led growth succeed? Well, primarily because of artificially cheap credit. Uh, exporters in most of these countries were provided privileged access to borrowing or access to borrowing at lower interest rates because exports are good, imports are bad. Okay, so we're going to grow by exporting. It worked for Japan. Well, why did it, it work for Japan? Because of the reason I gave you. It's not a model. It was only a moment in history. Now, the loose monetary policy led to commodity bubbles. We saw, in, uh, in, I, I was in Thailand before the bubble burst there. And it, it took so, uh, there were so many people coming to invest in, in Thailand that it took hours to get 
into the city from the airport. They were putting toilets into the taxis because, you know, it just took so long. They were putting microwaves to feed people into taxis. I mean, it was completely crazy. The, the, the level of, of frenzy of, you know, I got to find some way to invest to buy. Well, it blew up. All those, a lot of those investments co- went completely dead. Now, the early stage advantage, uh, the, uh, again, starting from a low base. So there's nothing miraculous about high growth with export. Japan's boom and bubbles blew up on them in 1989, East and Southeast Asia, 97. And China's is beginning to unravel now. So let's look at the changing economic realities. Interest rates are rising around the world. I mean, they were at, I I call them hysteric lows, not historic, hysteric. I mean, it goes against human nature to have negative nominal interest rates. It goes against economic logic to have zero nominal interest rates. This is crazy. But central bankers were saying, oh, no, this is the right thing to do. And, of course, policymakers, politicians and bureaucrats, they love that because they could borrow at very low interest rates and expand debt that they're not going to have to repay to your children and grandchildren. So, uh, interest rates are rising in most countries. Japan's trying to hold out. Japan's doing its best not to raise interest rates. But in doing that, the Japanese yen is, is collapsing. The Japanese yen is, taking, is being punished because one of the primary determinants of uh, exchange rates are interest rate differentials. So with the U.S. dollar paying higher interest rates than most other currencies, people try to go into dollar-based uh, assets. This drives up the dollar. So the Japanese are trying to keep interest rates low, and so people are moving out of the yen into any other um, currency uh, that, that pays a higher interest rate. So, uh, now, globalization, I, I'm not even sure this is correct. But what we do know is that these magical developments that these logistics experts were doing, the logistics experts were like magicians. They were... The, the, the flow of, of goods and services pre-pandemic was unbelievable. The way that things were moving seamlessly from, you know, high production, high productivity areas to low productivity areas to low cost, low price areas to high price areas. I mean, it was unbelievable. And they will work that magic eventually but it's, it's still taking time. We haven't recovered from that. So it's not clear that globalization has reached its logical limits. But what we do see is that the pandemic policies really put a kink, created a problem in the supply chain. So uh, economies of scale are beginning to be, be, become less significant to China because they already reached that in many of the cases. And they're moving into uh, uh, diseconomies of scale. There's a decrease in the rate of increase of trade. And there's a decrease in the rate of increase of trade flows. Now, China needs a high rate of economic growth in order to pay off its debts and to absorb the additional labor force entrance. And they're not getting it now. China's economic growth rates are roughly 25 to 3%. So, and... Outsiders are not as interested in investing in China. Again, partly because governments are trying to create an anti-capitalism, an anti-market, an anti-consumer sort of narrative because climate change or something like that, global boiling, some bullshit like that. I mean, what we're beginning to see is that government policies are purposefully dampening economic growth as a way of sort of giving into uh, 
green policies or green hysteria or environmental hysteria that is, uh, is probably as misguided as the public health policies were under the uh, COVID pandemic. So, okay, we got uh, other, other markets, um, uh, Vietnam, Mexico is now producing what used to be produced in China. Why? Because the wage rates in China have gone up more rapidly than the wage rates in, uh, in uh, Mexico. So the differential between the Mexican uh, labor costs and Chinese labor costs has narrowed so that when you factor in transportation costs, especially to selling to Gringolandia, People are now producing Mexico, what they would have produced in China. So we're beginning to see other emerging markets taking away China's exports the way that China took away from Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia took away from Japan. So imbalances in China created by the housing and fixed asset investment bubbles, greater difficulties from state involvement in the economy. Now, the... Central government of Japan has always favored the state-owned enterprises because that's where most of the people were employed. And if you begin to shed labor there, then you have too many young men on the streets, too much testosterone is usually what causes uh, re revolutions. Uh, now, the state-owned enterprises are mostly loss-making because they exist not because the products that they make are good or needed or whatever. It's because they create jobs and they sustain employment. Um, China's increasingly uh, becoming like the West in terms of providing uh, some welfare state uh, programs. So we got more and more imbalances in China. Now, and then China has this demographic problem I mentioned earlier. The growth, the Fertility rate is below replacement, which means that you're going to have fewer and fewer workers that are ne needed to support a larger and larger retired population. So this is what happened. Uh, it's happening every, almost everywhere where you have uh, rising incomes, rising expectations generally lead to this demographic problem. When I was your age, the population problem was too many people. The population problem now is too few people. But we're not... Human beings are productive. They are not a liability. Human beings have hands and brains to help solve problems. And if we, if, I mean, the, the, the population programs back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, until recent, and even now the United Nations still doesn't understand that the biggest de demographic problem, not just in China but around the world, is that, that birth rates are collapsing, especially in the uh, advanced economies. Okay, so, as I said, I'm somewhat pessimistic about China. Uh, there's too many things going against them. Most of them are of their own creation. They can't blame outsiders. So, thank you very much.